Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out this morning, and thanks for coming out yesterday and, and supporting this uh, Crow Symposium. We've really had a great time with our, our uh, talks so far, and today we've got an a action-packed day full of a lot of really fun uh, presentations, and I, I look forward to uh, hearing everything we're about to hear. I wanted to mention to everybody, uh, uh, for students who are here for class, please make sure to scan on your way out. It's not on the way in. Uh, and that'll and say that to your friends. Uh, we've had significant underwriting for our experience here uh, this weekend uh, from Merck, and I want to acknowledge that uh, formally right now. They have, uh, have made it possible that we can invite the, the really stellar set of folks that we've had coming to present, and, uh, and I appreciate their support. And uh, I want to right now introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Jack Davidson, who will introduce our first speaker for this morning. Herzog has been conducting research into how we uh, relate to and think about uh, animals in our lives for over 30 years. Um, his investigations have um, studied the moral worlds of cockfighters and animal activists, animals and science, and the impact of pets on human happiness and uh, health. He's written over 100 um, scientific uh, articles. He's also written for newspapers and magazines, including uh, the New York Times, uh, Washington Post, um, LA Times, uh, Wired, and Time Magazine. Um, uh, his book, this is the book, uh, Some We Love, Some We Hate, Some We Eat, uh, Why It's So Hard to Think About Animals, uh, has been translated into nine languages. Um, I'm a big fan, so are my students. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Herzog. We good? Can you hear me okay? Nod. <laughs> Raise your hands. Thank, Jack, thank, 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 thank you very much. And I am just so delighted to be here. Um, I am just so impressed with the, uh, with the university. Uh, um, when Scott originally contacted me a couple years ago about coming and talking, he told me who's gonna, who, who, who the, the other presenters were going to be. And, and I said, I mean, you've got the you've got the big dogs here. I don't I don't belong with these guys. I'm not really a dog researcher. It's a canine, you know, it's a, a canine cognition uh, conference. And uh, he said, well, we want you to come anyway because what you study is a different part of this. What you study is the human side of the dog interaction, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So my field is the uh, new science of human animal interactions, uh, anthozoology. And uh, so what I want to talk about today is our changing relationships with dogs. And I'm going to talk about what uh, Patricia McConnell talks about, the other end of the leash, uh, how our ideas about dogs are changing, where they come from, where they, where they might be going. Um, in terms of our changing attitude, let's do a little thought experiment. And this is borrowed from a classic problem in philosophy called the trolley problem. How many of you have heard of the trolley problem before? OK, quite a few of you have. So it's basically uh, this, you know, thought, thought experiment where you're, uh, there are various versions of it. But let's say you're, on a, a, you're walking across a footbridge, and there's a trolley coming down the track. And tied to the track or on the track are five people. And there's also this big fat guy on the bridge. And you know that if the trolley's a runaway thing, it's going to hit these five people and kill five of them. Or if you push the fat guy, it's always a fat guy. If you push the fat guy over the, over the bridge, you know, he's going, to, he's going to stop the trolley. And the question is, should you do it? And then there's various ramifications of this thing. You know, what if, what if it's Hitler? You know, what if it's an old man? You know, what if it's, uh, you know, what if it's Mother Teresa? So there's various ramifications of this thing. Well, researchers at the University of Georgia did their own version of the trolley problem. In this case, it involved dogs. And the, uh, you see a bus toward, uh, headed toward a dog and a person. You can only save one. Should you save the dog rather than? And then there's a list of, a list of options. A foreign tourist, a hometown stranger, uh, 
a distant cousin, you know, somebody you might not like or you might like, your best friend that you definitely like, your grandmother or your brother or sister. And uh, what, what the researchers did was they asked a large number of students at uh, Georgia Regents University, and what they found was, as you might expect, if uh, when asked to choose a person over a dog, most of the time people chose saving the person over the dog. However, it did depend to some extent on the, on the person. They were more likely to uh, save the dog over the uh, foreign tourist. And then, you know, the evolutionary psychologists would, would, would see, oh yeah, of course what they're going to do. The more they're related to a person, they're more likely to, likely to want to save the person. Then the researchers ask another group of students the same question, and they just changed one word. What was the word that they changed? Yes, your dog. If it's your dog, well, all of a sudden, if it's your dog, <laughs> the lines go up. Foreign tourist? No, you do not want to be a foreign tourist in Augusta, Georgia, if there's a runaway bus. Hometown stranger, don't do it. I sort of worry about these people that down here, you know, they're willing to, they're willing to sacrifice their close friends or grandparents and their children. And they also got uh, information, as you always do on a survey, of are you a male or a female? And uh, revealing one of the most salient factors of human-animal relationships is that women, Women here are in, in blue, men are, men, are, men are in red. Women were much more likely to toss the person and save the dog than, than, the, than the men were. And by the way, when we look, you know, I've been studying human-animal interactions for 30 years and have done lots of studies of attitudes and things like that. The single most important determinant of attitudes towards animals is whether you're a male or female. And you don't see it so much in the average person, but you see it in the extreme. So for example, veterinary schools right now, I know some of you are veterinarians, have gone from being an all-male profession in a very short period of time to be a 90% female profession. So animal rights activists, 90%, go to an animal rights demonstration, 90% of people are, 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 are women. Hunting licenses in Texas, I guarantee you that 90%, 90% of men are men. So this is, this is a big factor. In recent years, we've had this phenomenon called the humanization of pets. This was beautifully illustrated by an op-ed uh, by the next speaker. Gregory Burns, uh, who wrote a piece in the New York Times with that very sad looking dog, um, titled Dogs Are Dogs Are People Too, which has some really interesting and some really heavy moral implications if we're gonna take that seriously. But increasingly, Greg, Greg, Greg is right, we increasingly are think of, thinking of dogs as people too. In some ways, this gets crazy. We have you know, Dog Fashion Week. We have, I went to my uh, local, you can do it yourself. You, know, you can go to your local supermarket and you can buy, uh, you know, filet mignon and venison and stuff like that for, you know, for your dog. We have, there's a, a canine, there's a canine TV channel. So we can see that our attitudes toward, towards dogs, dogs are, are changing, but they, and they are incredibly important and in increasingly different ways in, in our lives. So for example, it was just Valentine's Day, USA Today did a survey, they found that 40% of Americans sit with significant others said that they would, you know, if, 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 their, if their dog were to leave them, they would feel worse than if their, if their significant other were to leave them. The statistics differ, but roughly 85 or 90% of people say that their pets are, their, their, their pets are family members. 57% of owners uh, say that if they're stuck on a desert island, they'd prefer to be with a dog than a person, which by the way, I agree with on that particular one. On the other point, I find this pretty sad American Veterinary Hospital Association did a survey. 40% of married women said they'd get more emotional support from their dog and, than, their, than their husband or their kids. And then 56% of pet owners agree, oh, not sell my pet for a million dollars. I am not in this category. This is my cat, Tilly. I would sell her for a million dollars. She's a really sweet cat. I know you would take good care of her. So talk to me after, talk to me after the talk. <laughs> well, dogs are our most popular pet in terms of numbers uh, and in terms of attachment. Uh, so we have roughly uh, 75 million dogs in the United States, so cats are second, and then it goes down from there. Interestingly, I've gotten really interested in the last couple months on the demographics of, of 
dog ownership. I've recently gotten some new data on this. So it turns out that whether you have a dog or not depends surprisingly on where you live. And maybe you have some insight into this. I, I don't. Um, so these are the, these, these are the state, you can see that places like West Virginia, Mississippi, Arkansas, this band of blue right here, these are the states that have high levels of dog ownership, uh, over 50% in some cases. On the other hand, these, these green states have half the levels of dog ownership. And I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I don't have my, handle, my, my head around, I haven't wrapped my head around that yet. If you got any ideas, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know tell me. Um, we also have demographically an interesting pet paradox. And if you look at the number of people in a household and their attachment to pets, you find an interesting thing. These are the number of people uh, with pets. And if there's one person in a household, if you live alone, you have about 40% chance of having a pet. On the other hand, and as, the, as you get more people in the household, you're more likely to have pets. Well, why is that? That's because parents believe that pets are good for their kids, I'm pretty sure. They're part of, part of growing up as an American kid now, is part of that is, 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 have, is having a pet. On the other hand, um, people that live, that live alone have the highest level of attachment to pets. So they have the lowest levels of pet ownership, but yet significantly higher levels of attachment to pets. So we have these, 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 these paradoxes. Um, You oftentimes hear that pet ownership in the United States is changing, that more and more people are getting pets. This is simply not true. Pet ownership in the United States and dog ownership in the United States has not increased you know, for, for, for 25 years, for more than 25 years. What has increased is the amount of money that we spend on our dogs. <laughs> and so even when you control for inflation, the amount of money we spend on our dogs has, has, more than, has more than doubled over the, over the last 20 years. So this is a reflection for the, 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 more, the fact is we care more for our dogs. It's sort of a monetary, a monetary assessment, the fact that we do care more for our dogs. dogs we're more willing to uh, spend money on extreme veterinary care. We're more, interesting, we're more interested in getting them, getting them expensive, expensive pet foods. So what I want to look at is the role of uh, biological and cultural uh, evolution. And one of the things that I'm interested in is human exceptionalism. I, I'm, I, I am of the politically incorrect belief in some ways that humans are different than other species of animals and we are different in some morally significant ways. I'm not gonna talk a lot about that. But I think one of the ways that we're different from animals is, and, I, and again, I'm not gonna go into this today, but I think humans are the only animals that keep pets. Chimpanzees could keep pets, but they don't. What they'll do is the chimpanzees in the wild will sometimes adopt a baby monkey or something like that, but they kill it within 15 minutes. And, and they might use it, they might use it, they might, might, might play with its corpse, they might throw it around like a ball, they might not eat it, but they don't keep it as, but they don't keep it as pets. So we're the, we're, the pet, we're the pet keeping species. So let's talk about the biology of this first. How did we, did this relationship evolve? And if you heard uh, uh, Brian Harris, you know, brilliant talk last night, he talked a bit about this, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. Now, we know that dogs evolved from wolves. There's very little uh, uh, disagreement about that. What there is disagreement about, about how this happened and when it happened and where it happened. So these are two headlines from the journal Science that just came out within the last year. And I cannot keep up with this stuff anymore. There's new stuff coming out all the time on, uh, on molecular evolution of dogs, on the, on the you know, somebody will find a new piece of bone. So, you know, one headline is dog domestication happened just once, ancient DNA says, and another one right on the bottom says dogs may have been domesticated more than once. So we really don't know a lot about that. We don't really know when it began. Uh, dog historians argue whether this happened 40,000 years ago. 45,000 years ago, or 24,000 years ago, or in some cases even 14,000 years ago. We know that the oldest sign of archeo you know, archeological evidence of attachment to pets probably comes from this, this Israeli burial site from 12,000 years ago, and you had this old woman who was clearly buried and put in a, 
funeral position, essentially, with this puppy. You can't see it real well, but cradled up under her head like this is this puppy that's clearly a dog puppy and not, and not, and not a wolf puppy. But we don't know where this happened. Some people say that the evidence points to uh, the Middle East. Other people say Southeast Asia. Other people say Siberia. And we don't really know how it happened. Some people still argue that maybe human females adopted, adopted puppies because they found them cute and sort of took them in, wolf puppies, and took them in. And that's how it evolved. Most wolf researchers say, nah, this doesn't really work out. Wolves are, don't, don't adapt well to being turned into, into puppies. And others, other people, in terms of sort of a consensus now, I, I think, is that basically wolves domesticated themselves through processes that Brian talked about, talked about, talked about yesterday. But we, we do know that in the last thousand years, not so much through intentional selection like we've had recently, but people began selecting dogs for some basic useful things. Dogs that hunt, dogs for hunting, dogs for guarding, uh, dogs for herding. And at least in Mexico, the development of dogs to breed because they tasted good and they were used, and they were used as meals. And then about 150, 200 or 150 years ago, s things began to change with the development of kennel clubs. And we had this in, in beginning really in Victorian England, we had a situation where people began to breed very intentionally specific breeds of dogs. So most of the 400 or so breeds of dogs that we have today, recognized breeds, basically they don't, they don't date back 14,000 years ago. They date back less than 150 years ago. And in that, in that 150 years, what we showed in a sense is human power over nature. Without knowing anything really about genes, people began selecting dogs for fashion because they looked cool, these arbitrary breed standards. And what we have in an incredibly short period of time was the creation within a single species of an animal that an adult could be this big and an animal that an adult could be this big. By comparison, this is the same difference between me and an adult bull elephant. That's what happened in 150 years of selective readings for dogs. So it's just, just absolutely stunning. I'm still, I, I, <laughs> one of my guilty pleasures is watching dog shows on television. And I'm just stunned by the array of creatures that, that we, have, we have created. So uh, as Brian mentioned last night, hooking up the, the decision of dogs, of wolves, you know, uh, 20,000 years ago to hook their lot up with humans was really a pretty good decision. Today in the world, there's about 600,000 wolves. And depending on who you believe, there's about a billion dogs. But the trick is, what most people don't get is most of those, those dogs don't live like your dog. By the way, how many of you have a dog? How many of you live? live yeah, that's right. Most of the dogs on earth do not live like your dog. They're not pampered. They're not fed. They don't, they don't sleep in beds. What they are is they're, they're what's, what are called village dogs or pariah dogs. And they're different from pet dogs in some ways. They, uh, mainly, they control the re their, their, their own reproduction. So they're not bred for a specific purpose. They're typically of a, of a, of a form. They're typically medium size. They typically have short hair. They often have perky, foxy, perky, you know, foxy-like ears and sort of foxy-like faces. Uh, um, they live outdoors. The bad news is that if you're a puppy of a pariah dog, you've got an 80 or 90 percent of dying before you're one year old. The good news is that if you make it to one year, you have a good chance of living seven or eight years or nine years. And you get to call your own shots. Nobody puts you on a leash. Nobody decides what you eat. Nobody tells you to sit, stay. In other words, these dogs are essentially, I don't want to call them wild animals. They're, they, 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 live, they live among us. And they need to live among us. They don't do well completely by themselves. But yet they're autonomous beings. And this, I think, raises some really interesting questions about what we've done in terms of bringing pets into our lives, dogs as pets to our lives, which I'll talk about a little bit later. 
So pet dogs, we control their reproduction. In the United States, there's hardly any dogs that don't control. In, in Western Europe, there's hardly any dogs that don't control their, own repro that control their own reproduction anymore. They live in our homes. They have low infant mortality rate, but they don't typically get to call their own shots. So this raises questions about autonomy. If dogs are people. If we recognize their autonomy, what does that mean in terms of us, them being under our total control? So. This is a uh, Life, magazine, Life magazine issue, which uh, is on the stands right now. You, may, you, can see it at, you can see it at the supermarket. And it asks the questions, why do we need dogs? Now, let me ask you, we've got a whole slew of dog owners in here. Why do you have a dog? What do you get out of your dog? Tell me, tell me. Companionship. Companionship? Alarming. Alarming? The dog is alarming or the dog arm? They alarm when other people come They alarm when other people come around, absolutely. Yeah, that's why a lot of people, that was probably very important in the original uh, tolerance of dogs that people had. Other reasons why some of you have dogs? Laughter. Laughter? Somebody say laughter? A dog's funny? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. What else? Somebody say. A child substitute. A child substitute. <laughs> that, is, that, that is a, thank you, that is a, very, that is a very big deal. And that may be the reason why people kept, keep, pets, keep pets generally. So there's lots of reasons why, you know, if I ask people why they, why they, why they have a pet or why they keep a dog, that they give, us, they give us answers like that. And these are what are called proximate questions. Like, what's the, you know, you find the dog cute, or you need it to guard. And if we ask Americans, um, you, know, you know, why do you have a dog, what you, you know, surveys typically find things like this, the same things you said, companionship, love for animals, families, you know, you know uh, some family member one and stuff like that. Now, interestingly enough, this, these are dogs and cats, and dogs are in red, cats are in, cats are in green. Um, you know, dogs have it all over cats. As a cat owner myself, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a dog person at heart, but I live with a cat. As I totally understand, my cat is not the companion that my, that my, dog, that, that my, that my dogs were. However, what I'm interested in is the evolutionary question. Why did humans bring animals into our lives? And why should we invest in a creature with which we have sh share no genes? This is an interesting evolutionary source of puzzle. And there's a no, there are costs to living with that. You, those of you that are dogs, how many of you pay a ton of money for the privilege of having a dog in your, in your, in your life? The, the, if you actually look at the amount of money you're going to spend over the lifetime of your dog, it's a hell of a lot of money. And the average dog and the average cat cost about ten or $12,000 over the lifetime. You'd think that dogs would cost more, but cats, cats live longer. They're, they're, they're cheaper, but they live longer, so it amounts to the same. In addition, there's the problems associated with, with dogs. Five million people in the United States are, bit, are bitten by dogs every year. This cost about a billion dollars in medical care. Um, in 2017, there, nearly 40 Americans were killed by dogs. Dogs, if you ask people if they're afraid of animals, uh, about 10 people of people with, about 10% of people with animal phobias are afraid of dogs. About 50% are, say, they're afraid of snakes. Your chances of being injured or killed by a snake are roughly one, one hundredth of the, you're a hundred times more likely to be injured or killed by a dog than you are, than you are a snake. So even though, even though, even though you know, our, our irrational fear of snakes is much, is, is, much, is much more powerful, dogs are also the second most common source of conflicts between neighbors. I'm just curious, how many of you have had conflicts with neighbors associated with, with a dog, with the dog? You can see many of you, at least half of you in this audience have. Um, well, what are some of, the, what are some of these uh, evolutionary explanations? Well, one is uh, biophilia. And uh, Ed Wilson, Harvard, uh, you know, Harvard zoologist, posited a number of years ago that humans have an instinctive attraction to the natural world. And that cute kid petting that bunny is my grandson. Is my grandson. It was interesting. I was going for a walk with him when he was about three. And he had a neighbor, and this woman had just raised rabbits, and she had this little bunny, and he took one look at that bunny and just made a beeline for it. And it was quite stunning, I was, I was quite stunned. He didn't treat it like it was a ball. He didn't treat it like an inanimate object. He, you know, you can see it. He was absolutely fascinated by it and touched it and played with it in an incredibly gentle way. I love this picture of these, these kids with these, uh, these African kids with these, with, the, with these pariah dog puppies. 
And Judy Deloach did a wonderful experiment where she, where she gave kids between the ages of one and three the opportunity to interact, either play with toys or, play, or mess around with the animals. And she had fish enhancers. As you can see, the fish enhancers, the, the, the animals were much more interesting to these little kids than were, than were, uh, than were toys that were designed for kids. So another possibility, you said child substitute. That's exactly correct, and that's a genuinely uh, reasonable explanation that pet keeping, especially dogs, represents sort of a misfiring of our parental, of our parental instincts. And you can really see this in this picture of a woman in Amazonia who has uh, uh, got her kid suckling on one breast and a monkey, a baby monkey, on the other one. And, um, I've asked a number of primatologists what kind of monkey that is, and nobody's been able to tell me. Uh, Lori, I'm hoping you'll be able to tell me at some point. Howler monkey, spider monkey, something, some South American monkey. Um, so let's do a little, let's do a little bit. This, so, so Conrad Lorenz argued that infants, including infant animals, have these characteristic features which stimulate our instinctive responses, which he called, sometimes called the cute response. My colleague James Serple calls this the cute response. So let's do a little survey right here. Okay, look at those, look at those. This is an experiment done by John Archer in the UK. So he would present people with pictures and he would uh, have them rate their cuteness. So let's do a little survey here. How many of you think that cat ha is the cutest? Come on, <laughs> not once. <laughs> oh no, are you raising your hand? Thank you, thank you, thank you. How many think that, that I think is a yellow lab, right? Or a golden retriever puppy, one of those. A lot of hands go up. Handsome German Shepherd, raise your hands. Okay, got some votes for the German Shepherd. And that King Charles Cavalier Spaniel. So you can see, what you can see, most hands went up with the real puppy and then the dog breed, which has been bred so the adults look like puppies. That's exactly what, what, what uh, John Archer found when he asked people, England, by the way, cats, adult cats? No, not that good. So now it's also possible that sexual selection could have played a role in our uh, preferences for pets. And uh, a couple of researchers in England investigated this, and uh, the results were quite interesting. What they did was that they needed a really hot guy. So they actually interviewed guys, and they had women rate these guys to see how hot they were. And they picked this guy, Antoine, who's pretty hot, I think, if you're a woman. And his job, was to walk up to women, randomly selected women, who he did not know, young women, in a Paris mall, a mall outside of Paris, and do this. And here's my French. Bonjour, je m'appelle Antoine. Uh, that's, that's it. That's my French. And then he would say, then he would say I, find, I find you attractive. Um, unfortunately, I'm busy right now. But if you give me a phone number, um, maybe I could call you and we could go out and get a drink later. Now, in half, half the times he approached the women, he was by himself. In the other half, he was with Gwyn Du, who was the dog owned by, it's one of the researchers' dogs. I contacted, I said, send me a picture of that dog. Where'd you get the dog? He said, that's the dog. Now, Gwyn Du is the dog's name in French, but, but the, the nickname in Gwyn Du is translated Doo Doo, which in English doesn't, doesn't translate in nicely as well. So in half the cases he was by himself, in half the cases he was with Gwen Du, and the question is, did more women give him their phone numbers when he was with the dog? And the answer was, <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Gwen Du was made a much more attractive. 30, that's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty big hit rate, almost 35% of women. Uh, Peter Gray at uh, UNLV recently did a sort of, not a replication, but uh, hooked up with Match.com and did a survey of whether people in Match.com actually had used dogs to attract dates. And um, they surveyed 1,200 Match.com Match uh, participants. They found that a quarter of the women said that uh, they, they liked guys, but they were turned on by guys that had a picture of a, of a pet with them, and almost all these were dogs. 
35% of women said they had been more attracted to someone because of a pet. Um, they asked them, have you ever used a pet, a picture of a pet to attract a date? Uh, women, not, not so much, men, yes. And then finally, this is the, you want, remember one thing from my talk, I want you to remember this. What is the sexiest pet a man can have? And the answer is a dog. If you want it, don't get a rabbit. <laughs> don't get a rabbit. So really, what, what's the most unsexy pet? pet? I like rabbits. Just to raise rabbits, man. Come on. Let's, rabbits are not hot. Dogs are hot. Rabbits are not. OK, and then there's the argument that you hear a lot in the press that dogs actually improve our health. And you see things like this all the time. Uh, USA Today, having a dog does improve your health. Marty Becker's book, uh, harnessing, harnessing the Amazing Ability of Pets to, to Make and Keep People Happy. The question is, are pet owners really healthier and happier than non-pet owners? And here's the good news. There are studies that have found that the answer is yes, that pet owners are more likely to uh, survive heart attacks or they're less lonely, that they have fewer, they go to doctor visits. Like you can see that whole list is they sleep better, that they get out more. That's the good news. The bad news is that studies have also found the pet owners are worse off. You never read this in the paper, do you? You never see references to these studies that show that mortality is actually higher. You are more likely to die after a heart attack if you're a pet owner, that you're more alone. In fact, I just saw a paper recently that found a, a relationship between psychopathology and attachment, attachments of pets, that, that pet owners are more depressed, that they're more likely to have insomnia. So in reality, this, so th this, this idea that pets are good for our health is called the, is called the uh, pet effect. Almost everybody believes it. How many of you have heard of this, that the idea that pets are going to make you happier and healthier? The evidence for the pet effect is much more mixed than most people think. And this is also true, and I'll just, this is sort of an aside, but it's something I'm interested in now. This is also true of whether or not dogs make good therapists. And uh, the, this is the, that line right there, that escalating line, dramatic line, is the number of scientific papers published per year on animal-assisted therapy. And most animal-assisted therapy uses either dogs or horses, and the vast majority, vast majority use dogs. I recently took that photo in the Charlotte airport, and they had a therapy dog in there, which is just to sort of calm people down. Is there's, you know, airports are miserable. You're anxious. I'm always anxious in the airport. And they had this therapy dog named Dylan. And I went over and petted him a little bit, and I felt better. And I sat there and watched a half an hour people stop and just interact with that dog. And it was really clear that that dog was relaxing people. And it was, it was really, really impressive. Um, so it's very clear that there are short-term benefits of interacting with, interacting with animals. And uh, one of the studies that I've seen lately uh, that I've liked the best was uh, out of uh, Lori Santos's lab, uh, the Yale Cognition Center, who's going to be talking here shortly. And they basically randomly assigned, first of all, they stressed out kids. <laughs> so they got these kids and they stressed them out, mean. They made them talk in front of strangers, as I recall. So the kids are stressed out. And then they looked at the effect of interacting with a dog, having a security blanket, you know, like Linus, just giving the kid a security blanket they could hold, or being in a room by themselves. And the cool thing about the study is that the, is in the dog condition, they were not with the dog and the handler. They were just with the dog. Almost all the studies, the effect of beneficial effects of pet therapy might be because of the handler, not the dog. And what they found was, was great. What they found was, uh, after 15 minutes in a quiet room, the group with the therapy dog was clearly better than either the security blanket or the groups that didn't do anything. So this is a short-term effect. Long-term effects have been harder to pull off. It's really difficult to look at the impact of therapy dogs long run, you know, on, on and, and the studies have really been mixed. And this is a study that was really ambitious. It was done by American Humane, and it was a randomized control, control study. This is the gold standard of research. So these were kids with leukemia. The study was so ambitious. It went on for five years. It cost a million dollars to pull this study off. It was five different cancer centers. 
And what these kids got was they interacted uh, once a week for four months with a therapy dog. And they had measures of stress and they had measures of uh, 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 you know, sort of general good feelings, quality of life stuff associated with being sick and also general quality of life stuff. And after four weeks of treatment, the data were pretty, uh, pretty stunning. Absolutely no effect, absolutely no differences between the control group and the therapy dog group. Um, they did find a small effect that the kids with the therapy dog's parents were in some ways better off, but on the kids themselves, there was absolutely no effect. And so what we have, this, I'm not arguing that therapy dogs don't have any effect. What I'm saying is that the data are really mixed and we really don't know. What we do know is that the quality of these studies has generally been poor. And this was a valiant effort to do a really good study and it turned out pretty clearly showing that there was, that there was no results. Now, I've been talking about the biology of our relationships. I want to shift and talk about how culture affects our interactions with, with dogs. And one of the things that I found, which I did not know until I wound up writing, writing, writing uh, my book, was that pet keeping is not a human universal. Uh, for example, I've got a colleague, a friend of mine is an anthropologist who is from Africa, and he's a member of the Kiambu tribe. And they have dogs in their villages, but they like dogs that are there to guard and to warn. They like mean dogs. They like vicious dogs that are going to keep people, you know, harassing, ha harassing them at night. They have no word for the ter they have no word for a pet. They, they do not have a concept for a pet in their language. And this is not restricted here. I've talked to other other people in other places that, that said the same thing. Peter Gray, UNLV, did a survey uh, from from the Yale human area relations files, where he looked at randomly selected 60 cultures and how they interacted with dogs. And he found that in almost all of these cultures, dogs had jobs and they were kept around, but they kept around for, for things like used in hunting, defense work, things like that. And it was only a very small minority where dogs actually petted and treated like members of the family. Members of the family. We also have and I just got this data last week. I'm, I'm, I still am stunned by this data. The name of my book is Some We Love, Some We Hate, Some We Eat. And that really applies to our relationship with dogs. That in cultures like with ours, we love, we love dogs. We, we treat them like members of the family. In other cultures, for example, uh, uh, Arab cultures in the Quran, dogs are considered unclean. And they don't like dogs. They, dis they despise dogs. And then other countries, Dogs are on the menu. 25 million dogs a year are killed in Asia and eaten. And the interesting thing is that people don't eat dogs for two reasons. Some people don't eat dogs. If I said, hey, you know, it's lunchtime, you know, we're going to be able to go to lunch after, you know, after Greg's talk, let's, you know, or, or Lori's talk, you know, we're going to have, we're gonna have well, hot dogs, but that's not the same thing, is it? Let's say we're going to have beagle, you know, fried beagle. You'd say, no, this is disgusting. We're not going to do it. We don't eat dogs. We find it disgusting. Other countries don't eat dogs because it's the same reason we don't eat rats. They consider dogs in the rat category. So look at this. This is stunning. So this is the number the per pet dogs per 1,000 people. And as you can see, that big line, America, of all the countries in the world, we are the most dog-friendly country. I did not know this. I was quite stunned by this. But on the other hand, so we have tons of dogs. But as you, as you go up there, you can see Saudi Arabia has very, very few dogs. So there's, there's, the idea that dogs are universally loved is simply not true. The fact is that whether or not you have a dog for a pet is primarily determined by where you live. Someone suggested to me that, well, this is because of national income. And so what I did is I took the European countries and I compared dog ownership in European countries with gross national product, per capita gross national product. And what I found was just the opposite. The richer the country, the less common dogs were. So I still, I'm not quite sure what to do with this. I'm still sort of, sort of sitting around. So we also have variations within cultures. For example, Sri Lanka is a, uh, Sri Lanka is a, is, is an island, but it's a multi, multi-ethnic island, many religions. And you can see that if you're a Muslim, your chances of having a dog for a pet are really low. But if you're a Buddhist, they're very, very high. In the United States, we also see some interesting differences. If you're white or Hispanic, 
you're much more likely to have a dog than you are if you're African American or, 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 or Asian. So the question is, how do these preferences for dogs sweep through culture? And this is something that my colleagues and I have been studying now for about 10 or 15 years, and we were incredibly lucky. The American Kennel Club gave me access to their data set of purebred dogs, purebred puppy registrations, as an index of the popularity of dog breeds. So my data set is 60 million. When I go to conferences and somebody says like, well, I have 100 subjects in my, in my study. Somebody else says, well, I have 1,000. And I say, oh, good, guys. I'm really glad for you. But I got 60 million. My N is 60 million. My N is 60 million. <laughs> and because my N is 60 million, I was able to attract some really, really smart people to analyze the data, way smarter than me. So, um, so purebred dogs became a thing beginning in about 1850 and to some extent on to the present. The thing about purebred dogs that's fascinating is that these are arbitrary standards of beauty. Purebred dogs, watch the, watch the Kennel Club show, they are basically forms of fashion, which is what I'm going to argue. These breeds are basically genetic islands, which is why cancer researchers right now are showing a lot of interest in working with purebred dogs because of differences, genetic differences. Behaviors are starting to, to look at to look at, at what these purebreds tell us about the, genetic, the genetics of behavior. I'm interested in this because I think that we can study our shifts in the popularity of dogs as an index of, of cultural change generally, the same way our taste in music change or the same way that our taste in food change. And that's what I've been playing with now for quite a while. So my end is 60 million. If you've had a purebred dog, up to the age, up to 2005, your dog is represented on my computer. Your dog is there somewhere on there. So what have we learned? One thing we learned is that America's desire to own a purebred dog just absolutely skyrocketed right after World War, right after World War II. Before that, it was only the rich that cared about purebred dogs. So here we have an example of a fad sweeping across our culture in an amazingly short period of time. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here, but our preferences in dogs, shifting preferences in dogs, are the follow a power law distribution, the so-called long tail distribution, in which about 80% of the dogs fall into about the top 20% of categories. And this is true every single year. And this top 20% is constantly constantly changing. And this is the same, the, the important thing is that this is the same graph that you get if you look at our taste in sneaker styles or baby names. The guys that originally did analyze my dog data specialized in baby names, what people name their kids. The same principles that govern what people name their kids and the changing popularity of, you know, Adam versus Sophie versus Hudson. That is exactly the same principle that applies to the, our preferences in dogs. And we, what we find is that it, when we actually graph this stuff out, we find these incredible things. Like, for example, dogs' fads can be incredibly big. We can have, dog fads can go anywhere. Some of the, in some cases, these dogs, for example, that Rottweiler, they increase 10,000% in terms of registrations in about, in about 10 years. So with these boom and breast breeds, what we see is that some, they hit a tipping point, and then all of a sudden they become hugely popular, and they follow what's sometimes called the uh, logic of fashion cycles, and all these breeds do, which is the faster a breed gets popular, the faster it crashes. So Dalmatians, when the movie came out, 100, 101 Dalmatians, incredible increase, followed by a 90% decrease in registrations over the next, over the next, over the next 10 years. Do movies affect breed popularity? In fact, they do. This is, for example, the graph that came out after uh, you know, that uh, shaggy dog. And you can see what I'm talking about. It hit a tipping point. Everybody went out and got an old English sheepdog. Are these the easiest dogs to live with? No, they're big, they're, they're, they're great, but they're not for everyone. And so what happened is you saw that, that this is a fad. It, it became popular, and the people found that they were difficult to live with, and bam, they went down. Um, the question that I'm interested in is, did, why did things get popular? Does a name get popular because it's a better name than another name? Is Adam a better name than Hudson? These are two of my kids' names. Um, not really. 
But what about dog breeds? Do dog breeds get popular because they're better? I mean better, do they have less genetic diseases? Are they easier to, are they easier to live with? So we did a study with uh, researchers at University of Pennsylvania, and we use a CBARC as an index, I'm not gonna go into details, an index of, of, dog, of dog behavior, owner-reported dog behaviors. Um, we had 9,000 dogs, 92 breeds, and we had data on breed behavior and health problems. And so for example, take chihuahuas and poodles. So, so here we have uh, you know, a bunch of things, dog rivalry, aggression, chasing, stuff like that. It turns out that chihuahuas rank high on all of those things except trainability in which, which they rank low. Poodles on the other, ha other hand were low in all the bad things and were good in trainability. So you would predict that poodles would be more popular than chihuahuas. So we'd looked, we asked that question over all of these 90 breeds, and this is what we found. We found that there was no relationship at all, zero relationship between dogs with good behaviors, easy to live with behaviors, and their popularity. We did find a relationship. We found that dogs that had more genetic disorders became more popular. And this is exemplified probably more than anything else by the English bulldog. And so if you look at the, uh, my friend, uh, 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 James Serple calls him a, a veterinary rehab project. If you have an English bulldog, some of you may have one, your, your veterinarian's gonna love you because you're gonna help send his kids through college. Um, they have a host of, of disorders, dental problems. You can see that guy's got a dental problem. Narcolepsy, cleft palate. They, they tend to fart a lot, they tend to fart a lot, and then sometimes they just keel over dead. So you would think an animal with these kinds of problems you know, I'll be out on the I'll be out hiking sometime, and I'll hear I'll hear a sound. <sighs> what is it? Is somebody taking their English bulldog for a for a hike? This is what happened to English bulldog popularity. Instead of going down, it went up. Um, recently, French bulldogs, which have exactly the same problems, even more so, they overtook Labrador retrievers in the UK as being the most popular dog. Now, that's the bad side. There is a good side. There's also dog fads that I think are great. And one of them, okay, I'm gonna ask this question. How many of you have a rescue dog or a shelter dog? I've never done this before. Whoa, man. So it, well, I, I've talked to many, many, many people over the years about dogs. I've seen, if I see somebody walking a dog, I'll go up and ask them, hey, tell me about your dog. It used to be they said, they'd say, like, well, I got a purebred lab or a purebred golden retriever. They never tell me that anymore. Within, almost always within the first two sentences, it's almost funny. You listen for this. You tell me if I'm right. Within the first two sentences, they will drop the word shelter, rescue, usually rescue, or abused. Inevitably. It's almost inevitable. And there's been a great side effect of this, is that the number of animals killed in animal shelters each year has dropped incredibly. This is the single biggest success of the animal rights movement. The animal rights movement has made no difference at all in the amount of meat Americans eat. I know that's a controversial claim, but it's true. A big failure. On the other hand, this has been a big success. The lack of, the, the giant decrease in the number of, of, do, of dogs in animal shelters. What I'm arguing is that dogs have become fashion statements and that there is a downside to that. And so here you can see what happens with these brachiocephalic breeds in terms of breeding them because they look like human babies. It's not been good for these dogs. Uh, <laughs> ear cropping, which is sort of now falling out of favor, but we've sort of, again, applied an artificial human standard of beauty for our dogs. Plastic surgery, I just found out. I recently read a paper on plastic surgery in dogs. People are have, getting nose jobs for their dogs, not for aesthetic reasons. Uh, I love the idea of nudicles. You cut your dog's balls off, but you're embarrassed by the fact that your dog doesn't have any balls, so what you do is you get these little plastic things to make it look like it really has testicles. That I don't think your dog really cares. In fact, would probably prefer not to, not to go through that surgery. And I recently came across, go to Google, and Google extreme dog grooming, and you will see a different world of weirdness in the human-animal relationship. And I'm interested in, one of the things I've gotten interested in is what people consider natural and unnatural with regarding our, our interactions with animals. 
And I'm basically stealing the ideas of a great psychologist, Paul Rosen, University of Pennsylvania, who's interested in natural food. So it turns out that people see skim milk is about 40% less natural than whole milk. But we use Rosen's techniques to, to look at whether dogs differ in their naturalness from, let's say, wolves and what types of dogs. And I'm not going to go into the details of the study. I'm just going to show you some of our results. We found this is a scale of 0 to 6. We would ask people how natural you find these animals so that wolves in the wild were cons are considered completely natural. On the other hand, we found that a mixed breed dog was about, uh, he lost about 20 or 30 percent of its naturalness. A purebred poodle, more than that. And finally, there's clone dogs. And what we're seeing now is the genetic engineering of dogs. So you might have seen when Barbara Streisand paid $50,000 to have her dogs, to have, to have her dogs, dogs cloned. And the Korean genetic researchers have genetically engineered a beagle named Ruppy to glow in the dark. So we're doing these things to dogs that nature never really intended. And we can see that one of the things about in our relationship with dogs and our love for dogs, we've also created some things that we might find uncomfortable. So what, what, what's, the, what, what's the bottom line? Uh, the human-dog relationship evolved through the co-evolution of biology and through culture. In year, recent years, for better or, we, or for worse, we've seen the humanization, the humanization of dogs in our lives. We have enormous cultural differences that people usually don't recognize, that even I'm surprised by now. Um, and our preferences for dogs for example, dogs like French bulldogs, et cetera, are basically sort of a crowd mentality. It's an important part of human nature. We are the best imitators in nature, no question about it. That's our, the genius of humans. You know, Brian talked about the genius of dogs last night, but the genius of humans is that we, is that we imitate better than anything else. And finally, when we study our, this is the, 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 this is why I study this stuff. It's that when we look at our relationships with animals, we see the best in human nature and we see the worst in human nature and they offer this window that is stunningly interesting and I think important. So thank you uh, very much and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Questions? Yes? That's a great question. The question is, do you think we'll continue uh, on with the humanization of all animals? And that's a really good question. And I think the answer is y yes, to some degree. And the interesting thing is that it might be that dogs are the gateway drug to do that. And uh, my colleague James Serpo has recently written that in part the rise of the animal rights movement is due to the increasing humanization of pets. And if we start thinking of our pets as family members, the next thing is what's the difference between your pet and that cow that you're going to have for, for dinner? Now, what I've been thinking of lately is that too. And it's the paradox of humanization. And I hate to throw this out, but what the hell? It's a symposium, right? It seems to me that we, the more we humanize dogs, the more we humanize pets, the less ethical it becomes to keep one for a pet. That if we're really going to say that these animals have autonomy, if they have a sense of being, if there's not that much difference, we wouldn't take a person and say, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't take a person and say, like, you know, I really, I don't want a little cute dog that looks like a kid, I want a kid. And I want to own the kid, and I want to make the kid live in my house, and I want the kid to do everything I want it to do, and I want to desex the kid because I don't want to deal with adolescent, what turns into adolescent boys, so we're going to castrate them at a young age. We would not do that to a kid, would we? No. But that's what we do to our pets. So I've, really, within the last, within the last couple of months I've been thinking about that. And by the way, my, I, I, I 
have thought a lot about moral issues. And my biggest moral issue is related to pets. It's not eating meat. It's I'm a cat. I'm, I own a cat. And I uh, have elected to let my cat, to respect my cat's autonomy by letting it spend part of the day outside when it wants to go outside, which means that the downside of that is that it kills things, lots of things. Number two, it's more likely to get killed itself. But my feeling is, hell, I wanted to, if I was a cat, I'd rather have me for an owner rather than my colleague Michael Delgado, who makes her cat stay indoors. And by the way, that's not true, because I'd rather, she'd be a great cat owner. But you see what I'm saying? It's a, to, me, it's, it, to me, this is the real pet paradox. The more we think of pets as, as, as persons, the less right we have what, to keep them as prisoners. Other questions? That's not ending on a happy note, is it? <laughs> Pet your prisoners. <laughs> yes. Um, I was just thinking about the, the distribution of where animal ownership was the lowest with the Northeast states. And yeah. it seems like it'd be harder to own a pet there because of weather. And then I started wondering, I think they might also have lower quality. I have not looked at that, and I'm still, play, I'm still playing with this. And I, th I think that's an interesting idea. I thought about that. Um, and I thought also because it's more crowded and it's more urban, it might be that people are living in apartments more. I go to New, I go to New York every now and then, not very often, but I see people walking their, walking their dogs in New York City, and I think, like, oh my god, if I was a dog, please don't make me live in Manhattan. You know, and so my guess is that's part of it. That, but what I don't get is that weird little that weird band of it. But my view is also that people keep pets because other people keep pets. That, it's, that pet, pet keeping is contagious. So I think that that plays in in a role as well. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, I do have a theory. I do have a theory. People are idiots. <laughs> and, I, and I don't mean that in a negative sense. I mean, I mean that pe things get popular for no, for no, for no reason, and we're, and we're victims of culture. And again, baby names is a good example. Um, uh, my, my, when my wife and I, when I my, my son's now, is, now is almost, almost 40, but when we were getting ready to name them, we thought, hey, the name Adam, that sounds like, that's sort of odd. There's not many people named Adam around. Well, it turns out everybody was naming their kid Adam. He just named his, he named his kid Hudson, which we thought was really crazy. There's three kids in his classroom named Hudson, you know? So, so I, think, I think we tend to be crowd followers. But to me, it's a really fascinating thing because we have these, on the one hand, we have people we have the rescue dog phenomenon. On the other hand, we have, which is good for dogs, on the other hand, we have this similar crowd mentality, which is creating these, 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 these breeds with, with genetic problems. So I think, it, I think this is one of these human nature things that gets the result. So that, that's my theory. When I say people are idiots, you know, don't, don't take that literally. But I think we tend to be crowd followers. And I, I guess the thing is that, that, that you know, we've done, the, the guys that I work with, they don't care anything about dogs. They study things like Neolithic pottery styles. They study things like um, baby names. They study things like why, why songs become popular. They don't care what it is. They just like big, big data. And what we find is that the same, the same principles applies to scientific citations, the web, web page hits. These all conform to power laws, and they're all conform to the principle of what becomes popular becomes more popular up to a point and then it crashes. Uh, you had, yes. This year, the uh, American Cat Club, I think they took in something like 80 million new breeds. They did. Here's the deal on the American Kennel Club. You can see that my data no longer does not go past 2005. That's when they decided they did not want the public to know what's happened with the American Kennel Club. Um, in 1997, they told me at one point not to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. At one point, 1997, AKC registrations began to crash. Their registrations are now about 40% of what they were at their high point. 
So that, that slide that I showed you, the graph went like this. It's now gone down to about like that. So they have, one of the things that they've done is that they've, they've expanded. And one of the reasons that they've expanded is that they're trying to get new breed. They want to bring new people into the kennel club. For example, hunters. They started recognizing hounds, coon hounds and things like that about 10 years ago. So they want to, they want to bring, they're doing more with, with, uh, with agility and things like that. Because the blue, purebred, purebred dogs are becoming less popular. I'm not, okay, I, I, I think what you might be referring to is the fox farm study, the Russian fox farm study that, that Brian talked about, and he studied these. So make a long and incredibly interesting story. story. Let me just see what my time is. My, a long and incredibly interesting uh, you know, story short. This Russian guy began breeding Arctic foxes for tameness, and over 40 generations created some very tame foxes which have been a gold mine for understanding domestication. Well, you can now buy these foxes. They cost a ton, but you can go online. You can go online, and the, the foxes are beautiful. They're adorable. Um, they act like dogs, but it's pretty interesting. So my guess is probably related to that study, those Russian foxes. What's that? I wonder if they have the smell like the I do, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think I better stop. I think my time is about up, and I really appreciate, I really appreciate, I'm going to be around, I'm going to be around today, so any questions you have, I'll be absolutely happy to answer, and uh, thanks for being so attentive, and uh, coming to your thanks.